For almost 50 years, Ed Goldman has been interviewing the who's who and the who might be of this region. Ed joins us to talk about his life, his career, and his best stories, next on Studio Sacramento. For over 20 years, Five Star Bank has created thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive. From economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Ed, in the 40 plus years of your career, who would you say would be the top three personalities that you've interviewed that have left the biggest imprint on your memory? Well, that's interesting. Um, I would say it would be Jane Fonda. Uh, uh, locally, uh, Joseph Coombs. Um, and, um, boy, there have been a lot of people I've interviewed in 49 years. Um, and I would think uh, uh, some of the people in theater that I've interviewed because... Like, like who? Like um, well, uh, recently, actually, this was in literature, uh, recently I interviewed Janet Fitch, author of White Oleander, and I found it an absolutely fascinating interview because uh, she talked about getting not paralyzed by research in her work, and she writes historical novels, so there, it, was a, it was a rather fascinating interview. In, 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 and you mentioned Joe Coombs, uh -huh. a, a local attorney. My closest um, friend, actually. Wow. Well, that's pretty esteemed company you put Joe into. Joe's been <laughs> on the show. Tell me, what was so fascinating about Joe to you? Joe, well, Joe and I were, have always been friends, um, uh, but we also share a very tragic uh, uh, commonness in that uh, our wives, we're, we're both widows, widowers, and um, uh, Holly and Joe uh, were at my wife's bedside when she died, and I was at Holly's bedside a few years later when she died. It's something about being a widower, and I've written about it in my, uh, <laughs> repeatedly. Um, it gives you a different perspective. There aren't a lot of us around. There are widows, but there aren't as many men who've lost their spouses and didn't expect to. That's true. Huh? Uh, and we both, our, our wives were relatively young women when they passed. But actually what is most fascinating to me about Joe is I can call him up on any topic if I'm assigned something or somebody asked me to write about something, and I'll say, do you know anything about this? Well, yes, I do. And he'll suddenly <laughs> know something about almost everything. Um, and I, I love that. He's curious about things. Um, Joe is, as we talk, uh, 86 years old, and he's probably one of the youngest men I know. And, you know, such an intellectually engaging mind. He's still out you know, trying to make the community better. Yeah. I, I'm curious though, let's come back to being a widower for just a second. Okay. What do you think, when you think about your experience, Joe's experience, and those of others who are widowers, mm -hmm. what did you learn through that experience that uh, was surprising to you? Well, I was surprised when, uh, not long after my wife passed away, uh, she'd been ill for nine years, and we'd been married for 29, and. Uh, uh, some people came out of the woodwork after she died, women, um, and I, I thought I didn't suddenly become attractive. And I didn't. Uh, uh, I, I, I Maybe you just <laughs> underestimated yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I have a pretty good uh, low self-esteem. It's, just, it's, I, I work at it. No, it's, um, and I, I had a good friend, and we went to dinner, and I said, "You can be real honest with me. What's going on?" And they said, "Oh, they saw how you took care of Jane, my late wife, for nine years, and they just assume you're that kind of guy." And I said. No, that was because it was Jane. I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not a natural <laughs> caregiver. I suppose, I mean, you, you do try to grow to the, into the role as much as you can. But I think it was just that um, people had a different view of me. Uh, it, it, every day was painful. Uh, it was, uh, but but I, I stopped thinking about myself very, very early on in the process. It was all about, about my wife. Just how many years ago was that? She died 12 years ago. 12 years yeah. ago. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, just curious because sure. obviously she had such a major uh, impact on your life. Mm -hmm. um, how, over time, how do y your views of the relationship kind of change or, or, or evolve? I mean, when you look back from the distance of 12 years. I just had it made. I mean, I just, I just had the best relationship uh, imaginable. You know, we met when we were 26 years old. 
And there's something about knowing somebody that young and you kind of grow together and you can grow apart really easily. But Jane, like me, was always interested in just about anything that came along as far as uh, art. She was a painter, a sculptor, I do both. Um, uh, she, she wrote, um, she loved music. Um, I write songs, I wrote a musical. So she, there was always something to share. Uh, and that, that was really important and there was always mutual respect. And that is something you know I, I've looked for since and I, I, I've, I've had some very wonderful relationships since, but uh, the, I think it was F. F. Scott Fitzgerald who said there are many loves, but uh, never the same love twice. And so um, I, I've never thought I would find that sort of relationship again. Understood. I want to come back to something that you talk about your shared passions and loves. Mm -hmm. You're a bit of a renaissance man. I mean, <laughs> you're, you, just, just sort of looking over uh -huh. um, what you've done is a little bit exhausting and, and a bit daunting well, uh, for the um, playwright, author, um, obviously journalist, uh, communications expert. I mean, what haven't you done? Oh, many, many things I'd love to do. I'd love to be able to change. What am I, what am I missing here, though? I'd love to be able to change my oil without uh, uh, crying. I, I'd, li I'd like to be able to, um, uh, I'd like to know more about science than I do. Uh, I'd like to know more about uh, 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 flora than I do. You know, uh, when you're writing about uh, things and you mention flowers or trees or bushes, you know, I'm always saying flowers and trees and bushes. I'm not actually saying the hydrangea or the this or the that. And I, I, I wish I knew more about those things. Well, it's nice to know that, that you are at least partially mortal. I want to I want, I come back to where you started. Now, you're not originally from here. No. Um, where did you grow up? I was born in Harlem, New York, uh, and I grew up mainly in the East Bronx part of New York. Uh, and you must be able to fight. I did fight. I was a boxer, actually. This, okay. is, why, this is why I'll never be a See, hand model. See, that's what I mean. Yeah, you know, I'll Once never again. be a hand model. I, uh, <laughs> but um, I was not a good fighter. I, I just had this uh, fatal flaw of not falling down, uh, not realizing that's actually a good strategy when you fight is fall down sometimes. You can catch your breath. Um, but yeah, you, you do grow up a little tougher, than I guess. And um, uh, at, 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 at my age now, it's, it's ridiculous to think of, of getting into a fight at all. It's, it's just absurd. Uh, and it's absurd looking back. So when did you, how did you make it out to California? Uh, my, my dad was a New York City firefighter. In fact, this is his ring, uh, his retirement ring from the New York City Fire Department. Let me see that. Put sure, that out. Sure. That's beautiful. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. He was a beautiful man. Yeah, he gave this to me on his deathbed, sadly, uh, and I've been wearing it ever since. Um, he retired from the New York City Fire Department at the age of 42, because he started at 22. And we moved to California, and he had this dream of owning his own home someday and having a lemon tree in the back, uh, backyard, and we did. And uh, he started a new career out in, in Southern California. And then when he passed away in 1976, um, I was just devastated, as my mother was, of course. And I ended up thinking I just needed a change of scenery. I didn't want to drive down the streets he'd driven down. I didn't want to think about it. So there was a job open in the city of Sacramento for the public information officer. I was only the second in the history of the city, the uh, second public information officer they hired. And so I came, I got the job, I came up here and started a new life. And uh, so I've been in Sacramento since 1976 and I absolutely fell in love with the place. Given, how many people would you say from this region have you interviewed over your career? Oh, thousands, um, I, I, I don't know. It's a, I've had my column in the Business Journal, it's daily for eight years. I had a column in Sacramento Magazine for 10 years and I had a column in Comstock's Magazine for 15 years. So that's a lot of interviews. So, and, and recently, uh, sometime uh, uh, in the recent past, you uh, essentially took over sort of an issue of Sacramento Magazine. Oh, that's right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, nice and and, and I, I wanna ask you, given the thousands of people that you've interviewed mm -hmm. and your daily column being involved, mm -hmm. how would you describe the essence of our region? Hmm. That's an excellent question. Hopeful, uh, forward thinking, much more progressive than people think we are. Um, I first moved to Sacramento, and again in 1976, and on the city council where every single one except one member was a liberal Democrat. And I thought, this is a very well-kept secret, Sacramento, because I everybody had said, oh, you're going to a cow town and blah, 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 blah. As some of the most sophisticated people I've met, I've met in Sacramento, some of the finest artists I've met, some of the finest musicians, some of the finest minds. 
So I love this place. It, it, it's a wonderful secret. It's place. interesting you say that, uh, given how well traveled you are. The you know Sacramento's always had this chip on its shoulder, which seems to be falling away. <laughs> of we're always trying to aspire to be the Bay Area right. or Seattle or Portland or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And my experience is similar to yours, is that we've got some really amazing sort of singular personalities mm -hmm. within this region. Mm -hmm. What do you think has kept us from naming that and claiming that and, and realizing that something invented here uh, other people want to get rather than us wanting to go and import something from somewhere? I think it's because there was this low self-esteem about the region. Um, for a while, uh, if you, um, I did a lot of work for the uh, Convention of Visitors Bureau, and one of their, their th mantras at the beginning was, Sacramento, we're close to everything. We're close to Tahoe, we're close to the Bay Area, we're close, you know. Uh, but we're we, nothing ourselves. That's right, we're nowhere, we, we are nothing. Uh, but then, it, we tried to change that up a little bit and said, look at all these wonderful things we have. That didn't work, so they went back to saying, okay, we are centrally located, and finally realizing that was a pretty good thing because we have, you don't have to leave Sacramento to have a wonderful time. We have great restaurants, we have great theater, music, um, uh, dance, a wonderful ballet. And um, But what people don't feel bad about anymore is that um, we're competing. We're not in the shadow of the Bay Area anymore. People from the Bay Area are moving here. And uh, it's not just because the, the rents are slightly lower, it's because this is a pretty vibrant place. Well, it's funny about that you mentioned that because uh, I was in San Francisco last week and I kept being asked about our new Michelin star restaurant, The Kitchen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I had to confess I haven't been there yet, right? But I, I have. <laughs> well, I'm glad. Yeah. But, you <coughs> well know, deserved. people from the Bay Area now ask questions about what's going on in Sacramento. Well, yeah, it, 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 by the way, it's a well-deserved rating. There, there are others in, in town that, that deserve it as well. But I've been to the kitchen, I think, three times. One time it was when uh, my friend Joe Kyoto, who is the publisher of Sacramento Magazine, uh, was married, and he took over the restaurant for one afternoon. That was just amazing. But it's, uh, it's wonderful food, and it's a terrific place, and they have a very imaginative uh, chefs and ownership. But um, I get questions about Sacramento ever, ever since Lady Bird came out. And my car is in Lady Bird in one scene, uh, which I'm very really? proud of. I'm very proud of. Um, uh, uh, I, expect, I think it, it was very hard to live with for a while. It, wanted, it sent an agent for me and asked about <laughs> residuals. <laughs> but, it was, uh, but Lady Bird really did help put Sacramento on the map because uh, it was beautifully photographed. And so you could actually see, you know, uh, there, the, 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 the scene where she jumps out of the car, but she's going over the H Street Bridge, you know, and this, which is a beautiful place over the river. Um, I, w I went to see it at the Tower Theater, and at one scene, they, they show a shot of the Tower Theater, and I said, any second now, a camera's going to come in. I, uh, and they, they talked about, on the way to the theater that night, I had stopped at the post office at 48th and J. They reference it in the movie, even by calling it, we'll go to the post office at 48th and J, which seemed like an odd thing to do. It sounds like you were pretty proud of that movie. Oh, I thought it was great. I thought it was a wonderful movie, and, and uh, uh, one of my prouder moments came I was asked to speak to the Point West Rotary, and I was telling them, I'd written about this, and I was telling them about my car being in the uh, movie. And afterwards, this fellow comes up and asks me to sign a copy of my book, and he goes, uh, my car was in it uh, as well. And I said, that's great. And what's your name? He goes, uh, Gordon. And I said, hi. And what's your last name? Gerwig. It was uh, her father. Her dad. Her dad. And, <laughs> and so we've been friendly ever since when we, when we run into each other. It was, uh, it, was, it was a terrific movie. It showed our funkiness in a way. Uh, and it was, um, it just looked like a happening place. You know, you know it's funny. I, 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 until you said that this moment, I hadn't realized why. I had had a similar reaction because I used to manage the Tower Theater oh, wow. when, I, when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had a very similar reaction. You might have been the guy who threw me out that time. I probably yeah, was. Well, I'm sorry about that. Uh -huh. It was a misunderstanding. Okay. I... It's, all, it's all water under the bridge. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. I need my wallet back, though. So, <laughs> not a chance. Okay. <laughs> I, I, did want, I did want to ask you, you know, with all of the thousands of people that you've interviewed, mm -hmm. how do you with all the choices you have before you, decide who's worthy of an Ed Goldman conversation. <laughs> well, I never think of it that way. I, I think, am I worthy of them? And that's the truth. Uh, I've, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not normally humble, but I, I am humbled by what I do because people choose to spend 90 minutes to two hours with you 
and you know how this is, being uh, the masterful interviewer you are, where, and they're sharing their lives with you, and that's a pretty precious gift. And I, I take it that way, uh, and um, I, I try to put them at their ease. I, uh, I do not use a tape recorder when I interview people unless it's going to be highly technical, uh, with, like changing the oil, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but it's because if you use a tape recorder, people will start talking to your tape recorder rather than to you, and they get very worried about, and they measure their statements. And so instead, same gift you have, I, I hope I have, which is that you make it a chat. And um, the best compliment I get is when we finish and somebody says, Are you, is the interview going to start now? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that, we just have it. We've, we've just had it. So. Well, you've taken these interviews and these conversations, and you've done a number of books. And the, and the most current book is Don't Cry For Me, Ardent Reader. That's the one. And I wanted to ask you, what, what is it that you had to say in this book that was important for you to get out? Well, they're actually, the, it's the third collection of my columns that the Sacramento Business Journal has published. Um, I think, well, one of the things is that some people, if they don't catch the daily column, they don't realize how many interesting people there really are in this town. Now, the book's a combination of the, some satirical pieces I wrote as well as some of the profiles. And um, I just like people knowing that, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the book actually, I have a friend who has a, uh, an online bookstore, and he sold many copies of it. Uh, and, I, and I said, but nobody knows who these people are. They're in different states. And he goes, no, they don't really seem to care. Um, but it's, uh, I'm, one thing I do want to mention about the, the book since you showed it, uh, 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 people think, Marcy Friedman did that painting, but she did the painting. She didn't illustrate the book as oh, some people think. Oh, really? She did this painting of me for a show she had at the uh, Natsulis Gallery in Davis. Mm -hmm. And when it came time to putting the book together, uh, we just asked, can we use the painting? And she said, sure. And it was just, I'm hoping people will judge the book by its cover because it's far superior to the content. That was well said and very diplomatic. Well done. <laughs> well done. How practiced did it sound? That's the key. <laughs> when you are going through your process mm -hmm. of getting together with someone, you know, there are all different types of ways of doing it. How do you prepare for when you're going to sit down with someone and have a conversation? My research on them? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I do is I ask them to send me something on themselves. Uh, that is kind of a telling thing. If they send you their bio from the website, I could look that up, and I will anyway. But sometimes people will actually write something, they'll, they'll write something original. And that to me shows there's a, a more of a caring factor. If they don't do that, it also me might mean that they're a little shy, that they, they don't think they can write something well enough to uh, represent them. But I always, I, th I always think it's real interesting, with, and I ask them to send a headshot. Um, and that's usually interesting, because somebody will send something that'll it'll take a selfie just in time for the interview. And you know, it is, you can actually tell a selfie because there's an arm not in the picture. Right. Because they're over here doing that, so. What is the most interesting piece of information when you requested it from someone that you've received? Hmm. One of them had to do with previous sex crimes, to tell you the truth. Okay. And, um, oh, okay, bring it. <laughs> well, no, that's, that, was, that was pretty much it. And I, I said, no, we won't be touching on that. Yes. Um, and I, I, every word I said sounded like a double entendre after that. We won't be touching like on that. Like that one right yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. And I, I just said, no, we won't be mentioning that. We won't be. Uh, but it was, um, it, was, it was somebody I interviewed a few years ago who had actually been exonerated of some things, but, but came to the interview continually thinking that's why I was there. And it was, no, it was that the person had uh, a, a connection with a very big business in town. Uh, it was much more interested in that, you know. Okay. <laughs> that was, yeah. No, you're not going to get me to say who it was or, you know, or even Are, are you sure it's just us? Oh, that's right. There's nobody watching. There, there's nobody. That's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> who, who among the people that you've talked to, did you have an impression that it, when it started it would go one way? and you ended up discovering a far different person than you anticipated. Every single person I've interviewed. I can say that unequivocally. Really? unequivocally. Um, unless I knew the person beforehand, which happens sometimes because you know over the years you meet a lot of people. But um, if I were not too enthused about the interview in advance because I thought, oh, how, okay, they're, they're a CPA or they're this or that, you know. And of course, and even that's a silly slam because some of the CPAs are fascinating. And we all make money and we all try to do something with it. 
So I think every time people have surprised me, and that's, um, I have a, 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 another good friend, Robert Harris, who's an attorney and an author in town, and he says that one of the things he likes about the column is that I always seem so surprised or childlike <laughs> when I discover things, <laughs> and I said, I'm not faking that. Yes. I, I am childlike, and I am surprised, so. When you, when you were talking with Jane Fonda, mm -hmm. you'd mentioned that a little bit yeah, quite earlier. Yeah, quite, quite a number of years uh, ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was that like? What'd you learn? Uh, that she's been interviewed before, and probably far better than I did. Uh, she, 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 was, um, she was wonderful. She, but you have to realize some of these people, when you interview actors, that they're even acting out the interview. And she was great, but it was like, um, uh, she can make you feel like the most important person in the entire universe while you're talking to her, and probably wouldn't recognize me a minute later in, in, on the street. And that's fine, and that's an interesting thing to learn because um, I'm always fascinated with people's senses of concentration, how she was completely focused on that interview, or made me think so, and then could walk away and do a hundred other things that day. And uh, uh, she was, uh, I was uh, uh, dazzled by how articulate she is. Um, and of course, as, as, as a red-blooded American guy, that was Jane Fonda, and she's still yes, absolutely yes. gorgeous. So, mm -hmm. so that, that interested me. Who's the fish that got away? I mean, if there's, if there's a personality or a couple of them Phew. that you haven't been able to get mm -hmm. yet. Well, um, I've, worked, I've done work for Jerry Brown, uh, one, the 1.0 Jerry Brown. I wanted to get him again. Uh, uh, I did uh, talk a few times to Governor Schwarzenegger, but that was not for the record. They, that was more a consulting thing. Um, I think I'd love to have a conversation with uh, Kamala Harris, actually. Um, uh, She's always fascinated me uh, with her work and her career, which has been uh, nonstop. So, but that hasn't gotten away yet. I haven't tried real hard. Um, I think um, uh, one of my most interesting interviews was with, was with um, the former state librarian, uh, Ken Starr. Kevin Starr. Kevin Starr. Kevin Starr, yeah. No, yeah a little Starr. distinction between <laughs> right, Ken and yeah. Kevin. And, and Kevin was, and I wrote about him also again after he passed away. He was a fascinating character, and I interviewed him the day after my, uh, two days after my wife passed away. And I went in to interview him, and I thought, oh, this, this is gonna, I don't, I don't, I, I couldn't even think straight. And somebody at his office had told him what had just happened. And he had me sit down and he said, what's, what's your main question? I asked him one question and an hour later I left. I, I never said a word. He just knew that he had to carry the ball and it was a fascinating guy. And I would love to have had the chance to interview him again uh, when I was in my right mind and he was still absolutely flourishing. Sure. You know, with all of those personalities that you've talked about and you know, coming back to when you did SAC Magazine and kind of like ran, Mm -hmm. Took the ball for an issue. Oh, for for an issue just on the opening of the Golden Wire. Right. Yeah. Right. But uh, it really raises a question: Is there any individual or institution that you believe represents the essence of the Sacramento region? I think the nonprofit and the arts community, and I couldn't pick out one person without offending many others. Uh, the nonprofits, we have a problem with nonprofits in Sacramento in that they overlap. A lot of them have similar missions. Um, uh, but I think um, the fact that they're all out there doing something good and you know they don't get a whole hell of a lot of money. And in the arts, you don't make a whole hell of a lot of money. And I think the fact that these people stick with it is, is absolutely fascinating to me. I think it defines Sacramento. Well, let me ask you to just to name two of the top five that might come to mind. Well, Michelle Steeb, who uh, had, has been the uh, CEO of um, St. John's uh, Program for Real Change and is now leaving it, uh, or is maybe consulting with it, uh, she has done things for homeless women that has just been amazing because unlike the optics of just creating shelters for homeless and getting them off the street, sh her, her program demands that they learn new um, and learn a trade during their, their eight, I think 18 months they're there, and that they have to be clean and sober and straight, um, straight in the terms of, of no drugs. And a lot of the programs like through HUD, like Housing First, they don't really demand that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's more of an optics. I don't want to see the homeless, but you know, they're there. They are certainly there. One final 
question for you. Someone to watch that you've talked to in the past five years, just a name. Who would you name as the person, one person that we should all watch? Oh, we should keep our eye on that. Steve Hansen, city councilman. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating guy, brilliant mind, uh, and he looks like a Shakespearean actor to me. I tell him that every time I see him, you should be doing Shakespeare, so. Oh, you're on his list for the holidays. <laughs> Ed, thank you so much thank you, for coming by and spending some time with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. For over 20 years, Five Star Bank has created thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive. From economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.